Excellent. So I'd like to welcome uh, Sam Tuttle, Assistant Professor from Syracuse University's Department of Earth and Environmental Science to today's ASRC colloquy. Sam earned his PhD with Guido Salvucci at Boston University's esteemed Earth and Environment Department. If you're not aware of that department, many of their PIs lead Landsat and MODIS product development. So it is quite a well-known department. Um, he did a short postdoc with Jennifer Jacobs at University of New Hampshire and taught a few years at Mount Holyoke College as a visiting professor before joining Syracuse University last fall and has been teaching remotely since. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, welcome to my classroom. So I felt that since uh, his department has not yet had a chance to kind of take hold of him yet, it would be an excellent opportunity to host him at ASRC to try and get him to think about collaborating with some of us and with the New York State Mesonet before he's entrenched in the department there at Syracuse. Um, he's already had a very productive time at Syracuse. He's been awarded a NASA Terrestrial Hydro Hydrology Program uh, Award to look at uh, using US Defense Satellite Special Sensor Microwave Imager, SSMI, and ESA's European Space Agency's Sentinel C-band radar um, to retrieve so, uh, snow. And he also co-leads the NASA SnowX work group on prairie snow. Um, SnowX campaigns are planned for the next three years or more. And the NASA Earth Sciences Division has already committed you know, to snow airborne campaigns and snow modeling through 2030. It's an area that they're really choosing to focus on. So I think he's in a very um, interesting and fundable area of research right now. Um, his work has been very satellite remote sensing centric. He's focused on satellite based evaporation, soil moisture and snow. He's looked at validating those products as well as looking into the causal mechanisms of soil moisture precipitation feedbacks. Um, more recently, he's looked at snow water equivalent estimates. And most interesting to me is some of the work he'll talk about today, looking at um, kind of snow melt and refreeze events. Um, so I hope you all enjoy Sam's talk today on how well do we know snow inferences from satellite data? Welcome, Sam. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, you gave like a nice intro to my talk because it's like, I'll hit on those different topics. Um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's really great to be talking to you all. Um, there we go. Uh, first, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, Syracuse is located on ancestral lands of the Onondaga people. Um, so I just wanted to give that acknowledgement um, right here before I get going, because without that, we wouldn't have a university for me to work at. Um, so Craig already gave an introduction to who I am, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on this too much, but I consider myself a hydroclimatologist. And as Craig said, I have done a lot of remote sensing, so I kind of have to consider myself a remote sensor. Um, and I try to use uh, a lot of observational data. So I do, I do a lot of statistical analysis and modeling um, related to observational data. Um, and I especially have two main interests, one being land atmosphere interactions, and more and more recently has been cryosphere, so snow and ice stuff. So that's what I'll be talking to you about today. So why? Um, <laughs> Craig mentioned some reasons already uh, for, for why snow is a good topic to, to study now. Um, honestly, I just like snow, but whether, whether you really hate it or whether you love it, um, it is important. Um, first of all, hydrologically, you know, snow is accumulating on the land surface is like putting money into the bank, right? So once that snow melts, you can release that water uh, back into the environment. So you bank it over the winter, and then either that can be released quickly, um, which could be hazardous in terms of flooding, or you could release it more slowly over the course of an entire summer, and that can provide water resources uh, for a long period of time. And something like over a billion people uh, on Earth depend on snowmelt runoff for their water resources. So it's a, it's a really important um, a source of water for many people. Additionally, it's the presence and absence of snow is the single largest change in albedo naturally 
uh, something that, you know, throughout the year changes of, of any substance on earth. So we go from, uh, you know, the summer where we have uh, low albedo to the winter where we have a lot of energy reflected back into the atmosphere. So it, it serves a really important local and global climatic purpose. And projections uh, from climate models tell us that uh, for the next 80 to 100 years, we're most likely going to be getting decreases in snow cover extent um, and snow depth in many places. Uh, snow is also supposed to be retreating up to higher elevations. Um, so that has a lot of implications climatically, water resources wise. Uh, something that just kind of interests me is, is whether snow can act because of that high albedo effect, almost like a climate switch. Um, uh, Betts et al. showed that in the Canadian prairies, the air temperature is 10 degrees colder when snow is on the ground. And, you know, that, that's a good question of whether that's causation or correlation. I think that's still kind of to be teased out a little bit. Um, but it makes logical sense that once you put a really reflective um, material on the surface that you would have less energy absorbed at the surface and therefore you would actually be getting colder. So we could have some massive changes to our climate uh, as we start to lose snow. And some estimates of, of that are that the, the cooling we could lose uh, due to loss of seasonal snow uh, could cost something like $575 billion um, in the next few decades. Um, and if you're talking about water resources, if we have uh, a large amount of our snowfall turn into rainfall due to increasing temperatures, um, in the Western US, that could cost us anywhere between 120 billion to $4.75 trillion over the next 100 years, essentially as, as lost water. Uh, depend, and that depends on the climate trajectory and how you price your water and stuff like that. Um, but there's, there's a really interesting website you can look at uh, down here in this link where you can, you can play with those numbers and, and see what, what kind of you come up with. And then some of us just really like to ski. I'm actually not one of those people. <laughs> so why remote sensing of snow? Um, well, first of all, it's often very inaccessible, right? We want to be able to measure it directly because that's the best way normally we can get a measurement. But in a lot of places, we just can't get there. Um, so we don't really have a whole lot of other options than to measure it remotely. Additionally, the places that we do have uh, ground measurements of snow uh, are very clustered often in the mountains that are, that are really important for water resources. But places like the north central US and the northeastern US, um, we have much more sparse snow networks. And this, this plot isn't, you know, ev this is not everywhere we measure snow in the, in the United States. This is just uh, a couple of networks, Snowtel and SCAN. Um, but you can see that there, we are very, very underrepresented here in the Northeast, for instance. And that's, you know, in the Western US, they're concerned about water resources, how much water is flowing into their reservoirs, how much are they going to have over the course of the summer. Um, but snow can have uh, negative effects too, in terms of flooding. And that, that's what really, really affects us and what affects the, the central, uh, North Central US. And in reality, remote sensing is really one of, of three ways we, we need to come at the problem, right? There's some reality, which is how much snow is on the ground. Um, and we can get at that by taking ground observations that have limited spatial scope, um, but high accuracy. And we can do it through snow modeling, which, you know, both of those are variable. Um, and it's kind of a question of how, how accurate are they actually? We have to compare those to the ground observations and to remote sensing to try to evaluate how accurate they are. And then the remote sensing, um, which is normally at larger spatial scales. And we need to somehow tie all of these things together in order to get an idea of what the reality of snow is. And right now we don't do a very good job of it. Um, there was a study a few years ago that showed that global snow estimates uh, are off by something like a factor of two. There could be X amount of snow on the earth and there could be two times X amount of snow on the earth. 
that's like the the best we could do as of a few years ago. So that's one of the things that really spurred this this SnowX campaign that that Craig mentioned, that's funded by the NASA Terrestrial Hydrology Program, is to try to figure out how do we best remotely sense uh, snow. And in snow has very different conditions, right? This this plot here shows the density of snow as it accumulates over the winter. It starts out very low density whenever snow falls on top of it. But over time, it, it becomes more dense as it metamorphoses, as it melts. Um, and so you can get layering and you can get larger crystals. Um, and things can get very complex when you're trying to look at electromagnetic radiation coming from the snow. So in all likelihood, in order to do the best job that we can of estimating snow globally, it's going to be need to be some mix of multiple satellite remote sensing techniques, uh, modeling, and ground ground measurements. So it's it's going to be a combination of all three. There's no kind of silver bullet in in this uh, kind of realm. So what I want to talk to you today uh, about is snow melt and refreeze events. Um, and then I'll talk to you a little bit later about some kind of future things that I'm that I'm working on, current and future things. So first of all, I just wanted to, you know, make sure everyone is uh, knows kind of the terminology here. So, um, what hydrologists um, and water resources people are most interested in when it comes to snow is snow water equivalent or sweep. And what that is is the amount of water, so the depth of water that's left over when you melt some depth of snow, right? So if, if you have 10 centimeters of snow and it has 20% density, so it's essentially 20% um, ice and 80% air. Um, if you melt that down, you get two centimeters of, of water. So this is what most people really wanna know. When we're talking about measuring snow globally, usually that's what we're interested in. Now, when it comes to remote sensing of snow water equivalent, we can learn about that in multiple different ways. When we use microwave radiation, uh, the snow crystals actually will, will scatter uh, microwave radiation. So if we're talking about passive microwave, which means that we're just looking down at the earth and measuring however much microwave radiation is coming up from the ground, the amount of snow that there is will uh, determine how much microwave radiation we see. If you have bare ground, you'll see more than if you have uh, a moderate snowpack or a deeper snowpack. The more snow you have, the less radiation actually makes it out because of that scattering. But when you get liquid water in the snow, absorption processes dominate. So you get a lot of absorption and re-emission of microwave radiation. So you lose the signal um, of how deep the snow is essentially. Which, uh, which keeps you from being able to estimate how much snow water equivalent there is. So when we're, trying to talk, when we're talking about snow melts, what I really mean is, is there liquid water in snow? And that's important to know if we want to, for instance, be merging remote sensing observations with models. We need to know when the snow is wet because that's not going to give us a faith, faithful representation of how much uh, snow water equivalent is there. And, uh, oops. And NASA SnowX has recognized that. So this is a this is a kind of a roadmap. It's like a stoplight map of um, different types of things we want to know about snow and the different columns or like ways you know conditions under which we could measure snow. And the the different rows are different techniques we can use. And you can see there's the melt column here um, is the third column and it's it's red meaning like not possible to detect melt using a lot of different techniques. Um, one of the ones that isn't here is passive microwave, which I'm going to be talking about today. That has kind of a yellow one, meaning that the capacity is potentially there, but and we need to really better define the uncertainty. So basically, this is something that's important to know if we want to be globally estimating snow, and it's something that we need to know more about. Um, so just to take a step back to, to your first physics class, um, all objects that are above absolute zero emit some amount of radiation. And what frequency that is and what intensity the, that is, uh, is dependent on your physical temperature. So like we are all at a temperature where we emit some radiation 
uh, all around the room. And we, most of it we can't see because it's in the infrared. And the Earth also emits radiation, mostly in the infrared. You can see the Earth is this kind of like little um, dark colored uh, distribution here, but it does extend into the microwave. And the microwave is what's really useful for uh, remote sensing of water because water is, is sensitive to it. It's just like the way the microwave in your house works. Water will absorb microwave radiation, which will heat it up, it will excite it, and that like heats up your food, right? So we actually uh, remotely sense soil moisture at, at really similar um, frequencies that, that your microwave works at. Um, but uh, for snow, we use a little bit of a higher frequency. So it doesn't penetrate quite through, uh, quite as well into the ground. Okay, so satellites report that microwave radiation as a temperature. And so the temperature is uh, the temperature of a black body. So a black body being an ideal object like, like the sun, which according to physic our physical theory, uh, emits as much radiation as, as it possibly could. Um, so when we look down at the Earth, we measure microwave radiation and then the satellites report it as a temperature if it was looking at a black body. So what you get back is something called brightness temperatures. And, and the brightness temperature can be related uh, to the physical temperature of whatever the satellite is looking at, uh, multiplied by some constant called the emissivity, which is just basically like, how well do you emit radiation? So the emissivity of water is, is almost one, which means that water emits radiation quite well. Um, but snow is on the order of 0.4 to 0.1. It varies very broadly, depending on its depth, depending on its grain size, uh, is there water in it, all, all sorts of things like that. So the deeper snow, the snow is, the, the smaller the emissivity, and the, wet, the wetter the snow is, the, the higher the emissivity. So we can use uh, that property of the snow emission to, to identify when there's actually snow melting and, and when it's freezing. And so some, some people have done this, uh, especially Ramage and Isaacs were one of the first people to do this. Um, and they developed something called the DAV. They looked at the change in the brightness temperature observed by a satellite at night versus the day. So at night when the snow is often frozen and during the day when it's most likely to melt. And so they looked at the change in that amount of microwave radiation uh, observed by the satellite. And they were able to see if you had a large jump in, for instance, you had a large increase in brightness temperature from nighttime to daytime, that might tell you that the snow melted. And if you had a large decrease from daytime to nighttime, that might tell you that the snow froze. So here's a look at what, that, what the satellite actually sees. Um, this is brightness temperature during the daytime on the top plot and the nighttime in the bottom. Those white streaks are places where on this day, the satellite actually didn't observe. So this particular satellite doesn't observe the entire Earth in a single day, but it almost does. And so to, to find that, that DAV, the difference between the nighttime and the daytime, you just take one and subtract it from the other. So this is what that would look like, which is this kind of like trippy um, looking plot. It looks like we're looking at a tie dye shirt or something. Um, so this is the difference. This is daytime brightness temperature minus nighttime. So this is where if we saw really high swings in, in this quantity, it might tell us that we had a change in the phase of water. Um, so we went from frozen snow to, to liquid water or something like that. And there's some interesting features you can see here, uh, like off of South America, there's this kind of dark purple swath and this um, green swath that's actually um, a, a storm, a big storm in the Southern Ocean. That's where it was 12 hours ago is the purple and where it is now is the green, which is kind of interesting. But if you look up in Northern Canada and, and kind of Northern Russia here, you see some yellows and greens, some positive numbers. And I know from the time of year that that's actually melting snow that we were able to detect because it was frozen at night and then it melted during the day. So that's what we're really looking for when we use this technique. Um, okay, so I've kind of talked about that already. This is what it looks like if you look at it in a time series. Now, this is a very busy plot, um, but what it's showing here in the black is that 
difference that I showed you on the previous slide. So this is the difference in the brightness temperature. Actually, no, sorry, that is just the brightness temperature. Um, so that's just what the satellite is seeing and it's reporting it on a 12 hour uh, basis. So when you see really wild swings in the brightness temperature, like you see in this yellow highlighted region, it's extremely variable. That might suggest to you that there, there is melt and refreeze happening because you're, you're changing the phase of water from night to day. So when I was thinking about this, um, you know, I, I looked at that equation and said, okay, this, this makes a lot of sense. Um, we're trying to identify a change in the emissivity as we change phase of water. But what about the change in temperature that's just happening on the ground? So these techniques didn't factor out um, the, the temperature change that was happening from night to day, um, just the physical temperature change. It was only looking at what the satellite sees. So I said, okay, if we can factor out the change in air temperature, which I'm using as a proxy for the change in the physical temperature of whatever the satellite's looking at, that would allow for better isolation of snow phase changes, of, of melt and refreeze. So I'm gonna take a look at some data here um, up on the border between Minnesota and North Dakota. And this black box is, is a single passive microwave pixel. So it's a 25 kilometer box. Um, so we basically get one value for that entire box. And this is what the data look like if you look at the air temperature within that box, which is the top plot. Um, the gray line is the, is the daytime temperature and the black line is the nighttime temperature. And then the second uh, row, that plot is the brightness temperature. That's what the satellite sees. And same thing, gray is daytime, black is nighttime. And what we really wanna look at though is the changes, the 12 hourly change in those things. So in the bottom plot, I've taken the 12 hourly change in, in air temperature, which is in uh, orange, and compare that to the 12 hourly change in brightness temperature, which is in black. And so these, these places where you see um, the black line far exceeding the orange envelope, those are cases where we might expect that that is snow melting or refreezing. And just, just so you know, the, the gray bars, that's when there's actually snow on the ground at this location. So I'm gonna take this data in this bottom plot, these 12 hourly changes in air temperature and 12 hourly changes in brightness temperature and plot them against each other. And when you do that, this is what you see, this kind of strange looking semi-linear, um, almost looks like a spinning top. I'm not really sure what to call that. Um, but you can see some interesting features in this. So first to explain what you're looking at, we're looking at 12 hourly changes in, in satellite observed brightness temperature on the x-axis, so how much microwave radiation it sees, and 12 hourly change in air temperature on the y-axis. So when you see an increase in air temperature, which is increase in the Y, you should see an increase in what the satellite sees because the amount of microwave radiation you see at the satellite is dependent on the temperature of whatever it's looking at. And so you see the opposite for, for nighttime. So when you're looking at night to day changes, you should see a positive number, those are the red points. And when you're looking at day to night changes, you should see normally a negative number in both. And so those are the blue points. Now, when I look at this though, I see uh, kind of a linear pattern in the center somewhat. It's, it's a pretty linear relationship. And that kind of makes sense. Like if you're looking at the same place over time, the relationship between the, the air temperature or the temperature of the surface and the temperature of the satellite seas should be fairly consistent. But then there are these, these systematic deviations at, at high values and low values of a brightness temperature, what the satellite sees. And so those are, are what I wanna zero in on here. So I'm, I'm plotting uh, the same data just with different colors here in two different plots. So the color on the left is the temperature at the start of the 12 hour period we're looking at. And the temperature at the end of the period is on the right. So let's first look at these these outliers up in the positive side. So positive air temperature change, positive uh, brightness temperature change. These start out uh, a little bit bluer. 
So a little bit negative and end up a little bit yellower. So a little bit, a little bit above zero. So what that tells me is these are possible melt events. You had the, the air temperature was a little bit below zero degrees Celsius and ended up a little bit above. And on the other side, we had the air temperature starting out a little bit above zero and then ending a little bit below zero. So that's possible melt events. So that, that checks out from what we might expect. Um, if the air temperature goes up, then you could get some melting. If the air temperature goes down, you could get some freezing happening. So what I did is I fit a line to this central somewhat linear relationship. And then, you know, I picked a threshold away from that that accounted for most of the variability around that line in order to identify uh, suspected melt events in the red and suspected refreeze events in, in the blue. And if you've ever tried to fit a line with systematic outliers, you know, this, this took a while. It was a mini odyssey and regression. So I can talk about that later if you're interested, but um, basically this is how I identified melt and refreeze events. And it's detailed in this paper in, in WRR if, if you want to read more about it. Um, so now we're going to jump uh, from North Dakota, Minnesota over to Colorado um, to do some validation. Well, I, I have to call it evaluation. It's not like true validation. Um, so here we have another AMSERI satellite pixel, and we're actually going to zoom in onto Senator Beck Basin, which is a location in Colorado where they, they do a lot of nice measurements of snow. Um, and specifically, we'll zoom into this uh, Swamp Angel site down at the bottom. So one of the difficulties in, in validating or even measuring uh, snow melt is that there really aren't great ways to do it. There are some measurements, uh, there are some instruments that can do it, but they're handheld. Um, there's, there isn't really a, an awesome way to uh, set up an automated instrument to do it. Um, often measuring the snow temperature is, is the best you can do unless you're able to reconstruct the entire energy balance to know when energy is, is, is leaving or coming out uh, uh, or going into the snow. Um, but this location does have a lot of great observations. They are able to put together the entire energy balance at this site. They measure the surface temperature of the snow, which is really great. Um, so, but one thing I want to say is I'm going to be comparing point data, essentially, to an entire satellite pixel. So there's a massive scale discrepancy here. Um, that being said, I think it works out pretty well. Um, so just at a first glance, um, I, I figured out, okay, when are melt and refreeze events happening over the course of the year? Uh, the, the blue tells you the frequency of, of melt events and the red is the frequency of, of sorry, of blue is refreeze and melt is uh, red. And I compared that to the snow depth at the different sites just to see, you know, does this make generally physical sense? And you can see that they actually match up quite well um, where you have, you know, for, at first in the, in the fall when you get um, some warmer temperatures when the snow interspersed with when the snow is starting to accumulate, you might get a little bit of melt. But a majority of the melt happens when you start to see a decrease in, in the snow depth and all the way down through to, to when it ablates and completely goes away. Now, if we construct the entire energy balance for the snow, um, so taking into account how much uh, shortwave and longwave radiation are coming in, sensible heat and latent heat, um, and then ground heat flux. We can figure out what is the net energy input and output to the snow. And that's shown here on the right plot. And so the, the gray points are all possible days um, that we had that information uh, from both the satellite and from this ground location. The red points are any time that we identified a melt event and the blue are any time we identified a refreeze event. And so you can see that almost all the melt, uh, melt events happen once the snow has reached zero degrees Celsius, uh, which is a requirement um, in order to start melting snow. You have to reach what's called an isothermal snowpack. Um, and then if you add in more energy, then you get melt. In the same, in the same token, when you're near zero degrees C and you take away some energy, you can go from melting to refreezing. So that's that's that gives us some confidence. This other plot on the left shows 
the infrared surface temperature of the snow um, from 12 hours before now to now. And you can see that almost all of the melting uh, happens when you have a snowpack that's colder than zero 12 hours ago that then approaches zero degrees Celsius now. So it went from colder to warmer. And you can see the opposite for refreeze events. So this, all of this gives uh, confidence that we're actually seeing snow melt and refreeze events from, from these satellite data. Um, so what this tells us is that we can see from passive microwave satellite observations, if we use air temperature to account for some of that diurnal temperature change that's happening, that can enhance our ability to actually see the phase change of the snow. So we can actually identify those melt and refreeze events. And everything we see is, is consistent with, with physical reasoning. So this is only one site though. Um, and I wanted to take this to a broader area. So I extended this method, instead of having to pick an arbitrary threshold around this linear regression line in the middle of the plot here, in order to, in order to pick out melt and refreeze events, I, I turned to a simple um, machine learning approach, k-means clustering. So basically I, I fit a line through the center of the data and then I found the residuals from that line. And then I said, okay, let's fit three clusters to the residuals. And the middle cluster gets assigned to all this noise around the linear relationship. And then the other two clusters select out the, the melt and refreeze events. So then I applied this to uh, the entire US and Southern Canada. Um, so this is a map of how many days uh, there was actually snow cover in this area. And you can see that it's dependent on your latitude uh, as well as um, the coverage of the satellite. Because once you get down uh, about below our latitude, you start to, to miss days once in a while just because the satellite doesn't cover the entire Earth at that latitude. But if you look at the frequency of these melt and refreeze events, first of all, they're, they're pretty consistently uh, around the time you might expect springtime. Um, they match up fairly well with what we saw at that one site. So that's, that's confidence um, instilling. And then if you look at the, the data in this way, which is the fraction of days that we have snow uh, that also had melt events or refreeze events on the bottom plot, you can see that the patterns match up quite well, which is very also gives us some confidence because, you know, as the snow is melting and refreezing throughout the season, you should have approximately the same number of melt and refreeze events. And you can see there's a, a lot more of these events happening at the lower latitudes um, where you can have um, snow that that actually doesn't uh, stay cold or throughout the entire winter like you might have in in the north central U.S. and also in the mountains you can get a lot of melting and refreezing as well. And so I have a video of this that I made of just the melt events. So anywhere that's white, there's, there's snow on the ground and anywhere that there's red, the redder it is, the more melt events occurred. Each of these images is for a two week period. Um, so you can see that the snow approaches and there isn't much melting. And then as you start to approach the spring, um, you get a lot of melt out over broader areas and, and the snow moves northward. You can see that during the midwinter, a lot of the, the lower latitudes areas are where you get most of the snow melt. Um, and then later into the spring, you see um, the, snow, the snow melt advancing farther northward. So what I think I have here is like a really interesting and rich data set um, to, to really start to look into deeper. Um, so there hasn't been enough validation done on this by, by me yet. So I think that's really the next step. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention from this that I find really interesting. And that's the slope of that regression line between the change in air temperature and the change in brightness temperature. Because if you believe that the air temperature is a good representation of the temperature of the surface that the satellite is looking at, then the slope of that line is actually related to the emissivity of the land surface overall, right? Because if you look at a different pixel, a different location, you might have trees, uh, you might not have trees, you might have lakes, you know, and so on and so forth. So how the satellite and the actual temperature of the surface are related 
depends on what you're actually looking at. And when I look at the slope of the line, which is in this top plot, bluer is, is higher numbers, red goes into numbers below one. Um, it looks like it matches up pretty well with the forest cover. So anywhere where you get uh, trees that are blocking the satellite, you start to see a lower sloped line uh, than when you have more clear areas, much less biomass, um, like in the prairie, where you see a higher slope line. So there's some, there might be some relationship here that's, that's kind of interesting that can tell us about the average emissivity of the snow over the course of the winter, which could be related to the depth of the snow or, or layering or, or, um, or grain size, things like that. So just to summarize, uh, I've applied this method uh, in the US and Southern Canada, and it's highlighted that the method is sensitive to, to land surface properties. So are you looking at vegetation? Are you looking at bare ground? Um, and it's also sensitive to the number of observations the requirement of the method, because we're fitting this line using data that's already been collected at a given location, we need to have data below freezing. So you might have seen in that in that previous video that there wasn't really anything showing up for the Pacific Northwest. And that's because their snow is almost constantly wet. And so I can't actually apply that method, this method anywhere where you have consistently wet snow. And I've also found that this is somewhat dependent on the satellite instrument. So I applied this to AMSR E and to AMSR 2, which are supposed to be essentially the same instrument, just flown on different satellite platforms. And you see some, some different things. Um, so that, that's kind of interesting too, and something I need to dig into. Um, and especially what I'm looking to do next is to extensively evaluate these data in, in a broad range of areas. Um, so moving forward, that, that's kind of my first task. And the other one is that this, this information, this method was applied to passive microwave data at 25 kilometer resolution. So right, that's a, that's a very large area, which is not sufficient to, to characterize snow, especially in mountain areas. So you can just look back at that Colorado pixel and see, you can see there's essentially like a couple of different mountain ranges almost going through a single pixel. Right, so you have valleys and you have mountain tops. So if I was a if I was a mountain snow person, I'd say these data are not useful to me. Um, so we need to be able to do this at higher resolution somehow in order to to do a better job modeling snow and to better job observing snow. Um, so essentially, we want I want to be able to still use passive microwave though because it has a long history in space. There's a forty year record of passive microwave remote sensing that we can use for snow. So how do we make these data more relevant to the, to the snow community and to, to end users, to people who might be like forecasting floods and things along those lines? So I have a couple of strategies for that. Um, one of them actually, uh, this was a proposal that I submitted uh, with some people, uh, co-eyes from the New York MesoNet, um, Jerry Brodsky and June Wong. Um, so the first idea I had was there's this new enhanced resolution passive microwave data set out called, called CETB um, that was developed by Mary Jo Brodzik. And you can see the difference here uh, between this bottom plot, which is 25 kilometers, and the bottom right plot, which is three kilometers, which is the highest resolution this, this um, product gets to. And it does, you can see a lot more of the features of the elevation of the land surface showing up, which is here on the top right uh, in this higher resolution image than in here where basically it all gets smeared out in those big pixels. Um, so the research questions I wanna address with this is, is basically dig down more into how well we can actually remotely sense snowmelt. So are there specific microwave frequencies that reveal more information than others? Does the increased resolution of this product actually lead to more accurate melt detection? Um, can we actually nail down exactly what the satellite is seeing? So there's a site that uh, hopefully will be, if this gets funded, we'll be setting up in Sleepers River, Vermont, um, where we have temperature profiles through the snow. So we can really see what's happening inside of the snowpack and compare that to what we're seeing in the satellite to, to figure out what actually is the satellite sensitive to? And then if this works, we'll have a, a fairly long record, 20 years or more 
of the spatiotemporal spatio temporal frequency of snow melt and refreeze events. Um, so that can be used to monitor uh, changes in snow as the climate changes. And here's just a look at where, where we've proposed to do that. Uh, there's kind of like a Western study region and an Eastern study region. In the West, we want to look at snow X sites. Um, so I alluded to those a little bit. Um, there have been campaigns in places like Colorado, um, Idaho, California. More recently, there was a site that I'm involved in in Montana. So a lot of these places where intensive uh, snow measurements have been taken. And in the East, there's been comparatively less attention to snow. But you all at Albany have this amazing New York Mesonet data set that's just sitting right there that seems ideal for validation and evaluation of satellite data because it's distributed over a broad area in a lot of different settings. And, and you collect things like um, the radiation budget, um, the uh, how much evaporation is happening, the snow water equivalent, the snow depth, um, air temperature, wind, all sorts of things that are important for being able to uh, evaluate whether snow melt is happening. And then I mentioned that Sleepers River watershed, that other site. The other one, uh, the other strategy I am taking, which this actually got funded, which Craig mentioned, is to, to use data fusion. Um, so I'm going to be fusing Sentinel-1 data, so active radar, so you're, you're shooting microwave radiation down at the ground and measuring what bounces back. Um, that's at much higher resolution than passive microwave data, but it's also at less uh, temporal frequency. So you get over past once every like six to 12 days. Um, so the goal of this project would be to take the days when you have both passive microwave and Sentinel observations on the same day, figure out how much snow melt uh, within each passive microwave pixel that the Sentinel satellite sees, and then be able to spatially distribute that snow melt uh, on days when you don't have Sentinel. So take that, take that microwave signal and be able to figure out based on the relationship I see with Sentinel, how much snow is happening and then figure out, okay, where in the pixel is it happening? Um, so that might potentially be able to get us down to something like a kilometer spatial resolution. Um, and I'm also planning to test that at, at SnowX sites, these sites where we have really rich information about, about snow. I'm just going to skip past this because I want to get to the, the last piece. I want to show you some, some pretty pictures. Um, so the overall goal of this is to, to be able to map these events over a long time period at high resolution, because that's really what's going to be useful for, for snow modeling and assimilation, for flood prediction, uh, for climate moder modeling, I'm sorry, monitoring. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is this project I'm working on in Montana in the prairies. And here we're looking more generally at how, how can we actually measure snow in this environment? So this is uh, the CARC, the Central Agricultural Research Center in, in Moccasin, Montana. Um, as you can tell, it's an agricultural research center, but in the winter, they're not doing much. So um, they're interested to know how, what's happening with the snow because that contributes uh, as well to, to the growing plants during the during the summer and to the stream flow in the area. They've had some flooding in this region. And this is part of a, a part of the SnowX project. So the general research questions are just basically how well do we measure prairie snow uh, in all, all of its forms? And what are the different uh, ways that we can measure it? By walking out in, in the field and, and doing ground measurements, by flying UAVs, by flying airplanes and satellites, what's the best way we can actually measure snow on the ground? And how much uncertainty do, we, uncertainty do we introduce when we go from very fine point scales up to those larger satellite scales? You're talking about kilometers or more. So here's, here's the site in the top left. Um, each box here is a set of soil moisture and temperature probes that also has an infrared temperature sensor um, pointed at the surface. Um, there's some MET towers here. Um, and there's also a, a cosmic uh, ray neutron sensor, which is actually mine, which is this purple thing. Um, so, you know, here's, here's some of the MET towers. There's a, there's a snow pillow. There's a picture of some of the drones. So some of the activities we've been doing. And then here's this, the CRNS that's actually mine. Um, so this is a sensor that can, 
can measure uh, the amount of water in kind of a, a broad radius, something like 200 meters. Um, and it's been extensively used for soil moisture and kind of experimentally used for snow. So, so we're testing out at this site, how well can we actually get snow information from, from a sensor like this? And if you're interested, I can talk more about it later. But this is a really interesting environment because it's so spatially variable. You can see here on the left plot, like if you have a little bit of stubble left on the ground, that catches snow. And right here in the middle plot, this is standing in one place and looking west towards a windbreak. And then this right plot is standing in the same spot and looking east. So you go from something like almost two meters of snow drift to essentially nothing over, a, over something like 30 meters. And you can see that here. Um, here's that snow drift in the upper left, um, grading into kind of this tufted grass on the right. And then there's a bare field where there's almost no snow. And then when you get to the other side of that field, you get a little bit of stubble and then you get uh, essentially another snow drift. And you can really see the patterns here in the bottom right. These are the snow drifts in the left side. And then here's that kind of um, bare field here with snow kind of spattered across it. In addition to that, this is an extremely windy environment and not everyone has cover crops on their field. So there's a lot of dust that gets blown around. So you think of snow as like this clean stuff, but uh, in the prairies, you get something called snurt, which is snow and dirt mixed together. So we don't just have like pretty white snow here. We have really dense, uh, dirty snow in some cases. So you can imagine trying to sense this from, remotely from a satellite. You, the satellite might be looking down through the snow and get through the top like 20 centimeters and then hit a layer of dirt. And then you might get a completely different signal um, than you would get if it was clean snow. So it's a really interesting environment. Here's some, uh, here's an overhead of some of the spatial variability that you can see at this site. On the left is just like a, a visible image and on the right is a, like a LIDAR depth map. So the lighter colors mean deeper snow. And you can see it, it, the fields show up, the different fields show up and also the, the crop types and stubble heights also affect the distribution of snow in this area. So it's a really interesting problem. Okay, I know I've gone long, so um, I just wanted to finish with, there's a lot to learn. Snow is a complicated problem, um, and there's a lot of improvement that can still be done on it. And we still need to answer questions, simple questions, like how best do we measure it in different environments? Um, and it has a lot of really important uses. Being able to do this better um, can, can help us really advance water resources, uh, climate monitoring, mo yeah, monitoring, things along those lines. Just wanted to thank a, a ton of people who helped help me get to this point. Um, and there's a lot of people who, are, who aren't on this slide um, who deserve uh, a lot of credit too. So thanks, thank you everyone. Great, thank you, Sam. I, I really enjoyed the, how descriptive you were and comprehensive across kind of all the areas you're studying in terms of the retrievals and the observations on the ground. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, I think you can add it to the chat or you may have to ask to be unmuted by raising your hand. I, am, I, am I unmuted? I, nope. I think No, we can hear you, Chris. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you mentioned you're measuring cosmic rays. Yeah. What well, seen there that is scientifically fascinating. <laughs> so, yeah, we're we're taking advantage of cosmic rays, but we're actually not measuring specifically cosmic rays. So, so how it works is the earth is consistently bombarded with cosmic rays. Um, and those rays interact with matter. And if they collide with nuclei, they can they can shoot off neutrons at different energies. And so what we're actually measuring is these things called fast neutrons that get knocked off of, of, of nuclei by cosmic rays. And the more water you have in the environment, so the more hydrogen, the more of those fast neutrons get captured. So you can, there's an inverse relationship between how many of them you, you measure and how much water is in the surrounding environment. So that's how you can get back to it. And it actually measures, like I mentioned, over a, a broad radius, something like 200 meters or more. Um, in, in most conditions. And you can also measure, depending on how wet your soil is, somewhere from between 20 to centimeter, 20 to 70 centimeters deep into the soil. Um, so it's a really interesting technique that like, as soon as I heard about it, I was like, I want one. 
um, and so so I'm really excited. Uh, I have a student working on it um, this year, uh, who's who's looking at the snow in the prairies using that. Beautiful, great. Yeah. And next we have a question from Justin Minder, the resident mountain meteorologist and snow modeler. Thanks for the great talk. Lots of really fascinating um, stuff. I, I was wondering if you could say a few more words about how you what what you're actually seeing when you use your snow melt detection method over over forested terrain. Is is that telling you that the snow in the canopy is melting, or does it somehow inferring what's going on beneath the canopy? Because obviously, you know. In upstate New York, you know, you showed the map of forest cover. That's uh, a lot of our snow is is in those very forested regions. Right. I think that's a great open question that I don't have an answer to yet. Um, I I would have to imagine that it's seeing the canopy, like at the frequencies we're talking about, um, nineteen gigahertz, thirty seven gigahertz, like that. Those those frequencies don't get through normal canopy. That being said, it is the winter time. So there aren't a ton of leaves out like there are in the summer. You know, most of the studies have been looking at biomass during the summer. Um, so it could be that there, there is a snow, ground snow signal that's coming through, um, especially in areas where you have deciduous forests. Um, but that's the answer that I don't, I don't have. Um, and so that's one of the things that we'd be looking to to kind of explore at that Sleepers River site where we have um, Dave Chandler at Syracuse has interest, instrumented that location with paired meteorological stations underneath and just outside of the canopy in a number of places. Um, so it's somewhere where I think we could actually start to address that question. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great, next we have a question from June Wang of the New York State Mesonet. Hi, Sam. Great talk. Um, so uh, the first question is related to Justin's. Uh, so I guess you have not tried over the forest. You said the slope change. I just wonder whether there's any capability because of the scatters are mm -hmm. way too big. Yeah, it's it's definitely possible that, that it is. Um, okay. I'm not sure yet. And part of the difficulty with that is almost everywhere we collect snow information is out in the open. Even if it's in a forested area, you know, the, the snow instruments are almost always in a clearing outside of the forested area. Um, so it makes answering that, that question kind of difficult when you don't have that sub canopy snow information. Um, but yeah, so I don't have that answer yet, but hopefully this this grant will get funded and then we'll be able to look at that um in a bunch of different places yeah uh my second question kind of a quick one right now you use the brightness temperature and air temperature differences for your retrieval do you mm -hmm. think the infrared temperature all the so-called snow temperature would work better than the air temperature yeah, I mean, I think ideally, so ideally, you'd be comparing the brightness temperature to like an integrated physical temperature of like the snow, the, the trees, the ground, the air, that everything in the footprint of the satellite. Um, but that's not available, right? So something like the, the MODIS land surface temperature could be interesting to look at. Um, but I think it's going to be very limited to, to open areas where you have very little canopy, right? Because whenever there's anything in the way, um, you're going to be seeing the trees instead of the ground. So areas like the prairies, it could potentially work. Um, and then I've lost the other part of your question. Sorry. Uh, in, infrared and the snow temperature, I guess. Yeah, the snow, what do you mean by the snow temperature? I know people measure the um, temperature inside the snow for several oh. layers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have looked at some of that at the Senator Beck site in Colorado. The, the thing about the internal snow temperature is that it's actually, it's pretty consistent, um, at least where I've seen it measured. It doesn't fluctuate all that much. So there's this kind of, uh, you know, conventional wisdom that um, the snow is often in equilibrium. Um, you know, it's, its temperature profile is, is actually not that different. And, you know, there, there is 
there is a difference between the bottom of the snowpack and, and the surface. But I think there might be more variability on shorter time scales in especially deeper snows than we might expect. Um, just because I think the I think the surface of the snow fluctuates a lot more than the base, for instance. And the base temperature is essentially all I had for that Colorado location to, to check against, except for the, the snow surface IR temperature, um, which matched up quite well with what the satellite was seeing. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have one more from Chris Walchuk, who's an emeritus faculty at ASRC. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, are there any um, tower-based measurements of brightness temperature and air temperature that that the same instruments that are on the satellites but that are sitting on towers and looking at a field or looking down from a mountain or anyway i i would have well anyway is there any anything like that there are some yes um there there have been some experiments especially in europe where they've pointed a bunch of different types of instruments at the snow including passive microwave and an active microwave um, so yes, those locations do exist also as part of SnowX, excuse me, um, at the, one of the main sites, Grand Mesa in Colorado, um, there were some of those installed over the past couple winters. Um, so those data, I'm not sure if they've been posted yet. I kind of need to check on that. Um, but there is, there are some places where we actually do have tower-based microwave observations, uh, to compare to more detailed, um, ground observations. No, and, I, and I'm curious, do they, I, do they show the same qualitative correlations that you're seeing between air and brightness? I think, I guess I'm just curious if, if they're consistent. So they should, <laughs> uh, but the, yeah, no, I haven't looked at that yet. That's, that's one of the things on my to-do list uh, for this grant, who's the funding I'm still waiting for. Um, okay. That's been starting next year, so, <laughs> so we'll get to it, right to it. Okay, also I had a quick follow on question. It seems like you treat melting as a binary thing and it strikes me that melting would be gray area. You know, you get some days when maybe 1% of the snowflakes melt and some days when 90% of the snowflakes melt. Yeah. Uh, what can you comment about the gray area nature of what you're talking about? Yeah, so past studies like modeling studies and um observational studies have shown that uh, the, what the satellite sees, the brightness temperature is, is very sensitive to any liquid water. So once you get to like 1% uh, liquid water in the snow, there's a big signal in the satellite. So that's kind of why I treat it binary. You're, you're right that like there, there may actually be a signal in there as well with the magnitude of, of snow melt. Um, but because there's such a difference between no liquid water and a tiny bit of liquid water, I have been treating it kind of like a binary. And when you're looking at the, when you're looking at the nighttime and daytime, um, to a certain degree, it's, it's hard to do anything but do binary, um, just because you have like those just two measurements a day. It's the kind of like there either is some or there isn't some. But it would be interesting to dig into the, the, the magnitude of the brightness temperature differences to see if there is kind of an amount uh, factor to that. The problem is that's also related to things like snow depth and density and the area of the pixel that melted. Um, so there are other complicating factors in there for teasing out that information. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, Sam. Uh, let me see one chat saying interesting work. Um, so Sam, just one follow on to Chris's question. Mm -hmm. you know, for the SWE estimation from remote sensing, you're using the same, using the same instrument or is there some independence where your, your melt estimate can add value to the SWE estimate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know if the melt estimate can really add value to the SWE as, of, as far as we know right now, except to say like, uh, don't use passive microwave when, when the snow is wet. That being said, there are other satellite techniques 
Um, there is some suggestion that maybe some some radar techniques can give information about um, snow liquid water, like the magnitude of it. Um, so there's there's some indication that maybe we might be able to separate um, snow liquid water from snow water equivalent, especially by using multiple different types of instruments. Um, but just in what I was doing, yeah, it's it's kind of like a, the way I talk to uh, someone who does data simulation with snow modeling is they don't want to use snow water equivalent information from satellites if the snow is wet because it's just there's there isn't anything in there that's useful for them. Um, so they're really looking to figure out when is the snow wet so that we don't assimilate that information and and mess up our model essentially. Okay, great. Well, I just want to thank you again for taking time to share your research with our group, and I hope that the uh, collaborations with us and the Mesonet continue. I think Sam would be available if you want to follow up with him for questions. Mm -hmm. And he is close, right in Syracuse. Yeah. Uh, close to another uh, sister SUNY school of ours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. ESF is a great school. A lot of good people there. Um, and yeah, I'm absolutely open to to collaborations and ideas and all things along those lines. So please feel free to shoot me an email um, if you want to chat about anything. Great, thank you. I hope you have a nice weekend and everyone else does that's online. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.